Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% of show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, a mother's plea to end her 10-year-old daughter's pregnancy is provoking an uproar in Paraguay. Plus, we talk to the Bangladeshi labour rights advocate who took on the international garment trade. And we also meet the undercover French police squad who are on the lookout for sexual harassment in the Paris metro. But we begin in Latin America, home to some of the most restrictive abortion laws in the world. In Paraguay, a fierce debate is raging over whether a pregnant 10-year-old girl should have an abortion. The child was allegedly raped by her stepfather. Now, despite a plea from her mother, medical officials say they can't perform the procedure unless her life is at risk. A 10-year-old girl was having stomach aches, so her mother took her to the doctor. They discovered she was 21 weeks pregnant. Police arrested her mother on charges of neglect. They suspect the girl was raped by her stepfather. He's now on the run. Laws in Paraguay mean the girl cannot have an abortion. Our constitution says you must preserve life over everything else, and life begins from the moment of conception. That means it's the state's responsibility to treat her throughout the entire pregnancy. The 10-year-old's case in Paraguay has thrown the whole region's Catholic-based abortion laws back into the international spotlight. Abortion is banned under any circumstances in six countries, while in most other Latin American states, including Paraguay, they can only legally be performed when the woman's life is deemed to be in serious danger. But rights groups say even in such cases, many women still have limited access to safe abortion procedures and aftercare. The Catholic Church really stands for not allowing a abortion under any circumstance, which in the end means that women uh, are seen as they don't have rights, that their right to health is, doesn't matter, and, and much less their right to autonomy and to decide freely when to have children. The Centre for Reproductive Rights is considering taking Paraguay to a UN court. It argues the government is violating the 10-year-old's human rights by putting her mental and physical health at risk. Every day, two girls under 14 give birth in Paraguay. Now, two years ago, more than 1,100 garment workers, mostly women, were killed when the Rana Commercial Centre collapsed just outside of Dhaka in Bangladesh. As a result, the disaster laid bare the very brutal nature of that industry. Yet from the ruins of that catastrophe, in an unprecedented move, international corporations agreed to create a safety accord for its workers. One of the key drivers behind the campaign was Kalpona Akta, a leading labour rights advocate in the country. And recently in London, I had the chance to meet her. Kalpona, thank you so much for being with us. Let's start with your own story, which is extraordinary in itself. You became a garment worker at the age of 12. You then went on to create or establish, rather, a trade union as a teenager. That is truly something amazing. Um, I think, you know, in a teenager, yeah, it wasn't common to raise up and, you know, stand up and raise your voice. Uh, and tradition didn't, you know, taught us that we should speak out. But I think the main uh, motivation or inspiration, whatever I say, is, it came from, from my shop floor where I have been worked 450 hours and making less than $10. Hour, $10. And when I came to know the law that the verbal and physical abuses was common on highs and toilet, unsafe building, it is completely opposite of the law. And that is what, you know, something like my coworker and me, we all together decided we have to speak out. And then, you know, I think I was one of the frontliners among them. And I became a union president when I was 15 in my shelf floor, and I got fired and blacklisted later when I was 16. So, and then I never stopped. The Rana Plaza disaster was horrific, but given the record of international corporations in turning a blind eye to labour exploitation, what made it different this time around? So the Rana Plaza disaster really, you know, showing a spotlight of the in Bangladesh for the first time. The media, they took these uh, issues internationally and the consumers group, they really, you know, outburst this time. And they made enough pressure to the companies that 
this is the time for you to make difference, you to do the right thing because of the bad publicity they are going. They knew that it will make their business any consequences, the bad consequences, of course, okay? So that is why they have signed on this accord on Bangladeshi Fire and Building Safety. So what makes this accord so different? So the accord is a legally binding document. So the companies who sign on the accord, if they do not meet with the clauses, they can be sued in their native country. How did you actually manage to convince those international corporations to agree to such a clause? You know, the, basically from our working experience, it has been seen that voluntary peace do not save workers' lives. So in back 2011, before Rana disaster, we started campaigning these companies to sign on the accord. Previously, it was named as, a agreement, as an agreement. Then Rana disaster happened and it was tremendous pressure got, got in on these brands and they had to sign on this legally binding. Many of the brands wanted to sign, but they wanted to have voluntary peace once again, and we said, no. So basically we thought that these all voluntary peace failing, uh, you know, save our workers' lives, so we need something more than that, which can be legally binding. Isn't it the case that they can take their uh, business somewhere else to another country that has less regulation. You know, if we look back to the Europe or US, okay, the textile industry was there. In New York City, for example, in 1911, a factory called uh, Triangle Shirt West, which has caught fire and burned down and killed 146, you know, worker. Majority of them was the immigrant young women. And after that, you know, workers ra raised their voices, they outraged, and things started changing. But in the same time, the company started changing too. What is the changes? Their place. But in the same time, they need to know we are all working together now. We are not in the 18th century. We have social media, we have television, we have, you know, all these Facebook and Twitter, whatever we say. The world is really under finger trip. So company, wherever you go, we are there. In Bangladesh, four out of five garment workers are women, yet it clearly offers these women, for the first time ever, economic freedom. But it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because they're also facing, as we know, labour exploitation and dangerous workplaces. So how do you transform those jobs so that they become a platform for empowerment? This is first time for these women to learn what is the economic freedom is, that's truth. So how we are transforming these jobs. So we are giving them training and we are encouraging them, I mean, them means these young women, to become a decision maker within their factory, within their union. So I think that that would be a better transform transformation that we are looking for. So when they are empowered at their workplace, then they can establish their empowerment at their home as well. Like at, in the home, in the, in the community, in the society, the women can raise their voice and say that I will be not count as a second or third or fourth as a decision maker. I'm earning. I can be in the front line. I can count number one. Kapona actor, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. In Paris, a recent survey revealed that 100% of women, yes, you heard that right, 100% have been victim of some kind of sexual harassment on public transport. There are now calls for a national campaign to stem sexist or threatening behaviour on both buses and trains. We headed out with a French undercover police squad whose job is to catch men in the act. Each woman is a potential target. Sexual assault in the Paris metro often involves getting too close up. Here, a man is feeling himself right next to a woman. A specialised police unit monitors and intervenes when it sees incidents. Their peak time is the Paris rush hour. They're following a man wearing a black beret. He leaves the metro, then hangs around outside at the entrance. He then goes back in to take another train in the opposite direction. On board, he leans right into a woman and touches her for two minutes. The victim does not realize what is going on, but the police do. They say attackers can carry out 20 assaults a day. 
They move in to arrest him to stop him from getting into another part of the train. Bonjour, monsieur, c'est la police. Tiens, ce que vous faites avec les jeunes femmes, d'accord Avec les jeunes femmes, vous suivez et vous courez dans le métro. Alors, ce que vous faites avec vos mains, monsieur Non, non, non. Nous, c'est ce qu'on a observé depuis une bonne demi-heure. The 62 year old says he can't understand what he's being accused of. Placed in police custody, he faces up to five years in jail. One of his victims earlier in the day makes a formal complaint. I felt something around my buttocks in the metro several times. I moved away. This is at least the fourth time something like this has happened on that metro line. It's a regular problem. Almost all the women at this metro exit have similar stories to tell. I've been flashed at and touched in the metro. I told the guy to stop and he called me a dirty prostitute when I pushed him back. Each of my female friends has had at least one assault, showing there is a problem in the metro. This psychiatrist is a specialist in the field of sexual assault. The attacks are not due to lack of affection and sex. The vast majority of attackers are often married or in a couple. So that's nothing to do with it. It's not sexual desire, an impulse, a need. It's really a determination to destroy. Victims often will not file a complaint for fear of feeling shame. And that makes investigation into such attacks extremely difficult. And that's it for now. If you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page. That's France 24, full stop, 51%. Or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. And please keep those comments coming in. Until our next programme, bye for now.